Welcome everyone, Stealthy Sharon here, and today I'm bringing you a 2020 year-end review of Humble Choice. I have to say that this was an eye-opener for me because even though I reviewed these bundles, I definitely didn't remember all of them. But first, before I get into it, I wanted to take time to thank everyone for their support, especially with having to start the channel all over again. It's been motivating to see continual engagement with the reviews, and I'm happy that my channel can help out in its own small way. Can't wait to continue the journey into the new year. But back to 2022, and what a year it's been, I think. Since I've never done something like this before, it's hard to say if this year was better or worse than the previous, but it felt better. Humble made its move down to 8 games as the norm as compared to 12 the previous year and 10 in January. The idea was the quality of each game would be better, and I think on average it has been. There's been a lot of less filler games, but that doesn't mean we didn't have any bad eggs this year. So I wanted to take a look at the months side by side and compare, but more on that in a bit. First, as many of you know, I rate my games based on whether or not they're must plays, strong or weak recommendations, and ones I don't bother with again. But I was curious as to how many games I actually played from these bundles, and what my thoughts still were on them. In total, I only played 10 games out of the 98 given this year, outside of just the reviews. From all the bundles, I recommended 22 of those 98 games as must-plays, and out of those 22, I only played 5. What exactly does this tell us? Well, not really anything. I just found it interesting. I still believe that many of those games are still very much must-play games, but for one reason or another, I didn't get around to playing them. So what did I play, though? In January, I said that I had fun with Farmer's Dynasty, but it was rough around the edges. And, well, after playing it for about three and a half hours, I decided that I really didn't want to go the distance with it. I finished repairing my farm and found myself unsure what to do. After doing some boring fetch missions, having vapid conversations with town folk, and ultimately getting my tractor stuck, I decided that I was done with the game. In hindsight, I probably would place this in the Don't Bother With section now. During the March bundle, I described Evan's Remains as a fun puzzle game with an engaging story, and that remained true through the entirety of the game. I actually finished this one in about three hours, and I felt the puzzles were at a just right difficulty for me, which probably implies that it's too easy since I usually don't care for puzzle games. However, if a puzzle was too difficult, you could always skip the puzzle to continue the narrative, which really was the bread and butter here. I thought it was really clever and had a nice emotional impact in the end. Maybe not quite the tearjerker that To the Moon was, but certainly left me with a similar feeling after finishing it. I did end up getting a second person to play Deep Rock Galactic with me, being my wife, and it was a lot more fun with two players. Unfortunately, I only put six hours into the game and I've wanted to go back to experience more for some time. From what I did play, there seems to be some variety in the missions, as well as different biomes that you unlock as you play further. This one is still a must-play for those into this style of co-op shooting. Banners of Ruin is another game that I think I'd change the rating to from a strong recommendation to weak. I suppose 7 hours is a decent amount of time to put into a title that suggests I had fun with it, but really, I kept playing in hopes that it would get better. Things don't get unlocked until you accumulate a certain amount of experience, which I guess is normal for these kinds of games. However, I felt that it was a limiting factor to the gameplay since you only start with two characters, so it seemed like I had very similar runs each time. I mentioned liking Yesser Grace for its story and nice pixel art. I actually finished this one completely with 8 hours in it, and I still hold by what I said. It was a good game, albeit a bit limited. The story gives a nice illusion that your choices really matter. Ultimately, it's only a few key moments that change the ending drastically. That being said, the game still gave a great feeling of tension and spending resources wisely to get the best results, even if they were just in the moment. I still feel it's a must-play if you're into these sorts of narrative-focused games. I finished A Plague Tale Innocence in 10 hours, and I stand by my initial thoughts. It was a treat to play. I liked the story, and I thought the pacing was really good. The fantastical elements did get pretty crazy for the time period, but I thought they were used to good effect. As a stealth game, I never felt too overwhelmed with cheap moments where they catch you easily, which was nice. I've yet to play the sequel, but I'm eager to do so with the high bar this game sets for it. 
I also completed Emily is Away 3, which took me about 5 hours. Again, if you don't think a high school drama story will hold your attention, then this isn't going to be for you. I liked it, although I wasn't a big fan of the ending. Slight spoilers ahead, so if you want to play the game without it, then skip ahead. Anyway, you were always doomed to fail with whichever romantic interest you chose. The game then forces players to play through the game again with the other option, only for that to fail too. Once you do that, then you could play the game again to get the good ending with the original girl of choice. Eh, no thanks. Luckily, there's a cheat you can do where you change some numbers in the I and I file, which is what I did. Good story, but it wasn't four playthroughs good. I completed Omno, and this was as chill of an experience as I discussed in the review. I enjoyed exploring the different biomes and seeing the wildlife. Puzzles remain basic, and I think there were only a few near the end that I couldn't figure out. This one still holds a strong recommendation to play for any who just want a relaxed experience. While I can't say I'm any better at Descenders than when I reviewed it, I did put some more time into it, about 4 hours. As I said, it's a relaxing game for me. I don't play it for long, but I really like loading it up to play a run. And a run can be especially short when I'm in the second biome, where I'm constantly riding too fast and doing death-defying jumps that don't actually defy death. For the month of Halloween, I did end up spending about 5 hours to finish Made of Scare. Excellent visual and sound design were points I made in the review, and I'm happy to confirm they continued throughout the entirety of the game. The story was even decent enough with a little bit of mythological spin which I appreciated. However, the enemy AI was very simple and easily exploitable which dragged this game down for me. With hindsight being 2020, I'd probably have put this in the strong recommendations rather than placing it as a must play. And that's what I played past the review times. As you can see, many of these games weren't ones that I put in the must play section. I think most of them I got around to playing because I knew they wouldn't take me that long. Taking the entire year into account, I want to be better about playing at least one game from each bundle going into next year. But we'll see what time will allow and if I'll be eating my words by this time in 2023. By now, I'm sure you're probably wondering what month I think held the best bundle this year. Well, this was very difficult to determine since the games are wildly different from month to month, and my opinions are subjective to the month I'm playing. And what I mean by that is I don't compare the previous month to determine how I feel about the games I'm playing in the current month. I try to be consistent, but I also strive to give my honest thoughts on how I felt playing the game. And sometimes that doesn't always match up with how I felt about a similar game in the past. As a way to bring an objective view to my subjective ratings, if that makes any sense, I devised a point system to rate the months, and by I devised, I mean, I stole them from the fellows at 3 Skate Pod, who also do Humble Choice reviews and other game reviews. Their link is in the description for those who want to check them out. Anyway, the point system goes as follows. 3 points for must play, 2 points for strong recommendations, 1 point for weak recommendations, and 0 for don't bother. With that in mind, these are the breakdowns for each month in 2022. From these ratings, we can see that January, October, and November were the top-rated months. This is further skewed, though. January had 10 games in its month, which makes it unfair to compare using that rating. And since I can't come up with anything better, I decided to change its rating. If we take into account my new view on Farmer's Dynasty, then it would be a Don't Bother With game, which takes January's total down to 14. Although, the month still has 10 games, so let's remedy that as well. Retrowave, as I later found out after the review, was a shameless asset flip that Humble didn't bother vetting, so I think we could safely remove that game from the running. I'll also drop Henry Stickman Collection from the bundle too, since it was more of an interactive cartoon than a game. Even though it's arguably more of a game than If Found, a visual novel we received in May. But hey, it's an arbitrary decision made by me for my own rating system. That brings January's total down to 12. There is one more hiccup with the scoring that some of you may have remembered, or maybe even experienced, and that is, I didn't receive the same games as many of you did in March and April when I still lived in Japan. So I'd like to throw out a reminder that these scores are based on the games I actually played, and not what might have been in the bundle you received, which in this case would be Madame Dan and Naruto Toboruto Shinobi Strikers. 
Anyway, with January's corrected score, we can determine average for the year, which is a total of 13 and a half. Less than half of the months run under the average, which I guess is good, but without having another yearly average, this figure still doesn't tell us much. Just another interesting tidbit to look at. One thing I'd like to point out is I said in the December review that I felt December was the weakest month of the year. I'd like to retract that statement, because from the numbers and my own personal sentiment as I went down memory lane, I realized this wasn't the case. Back to the best bundle of the year, though. From the adjusted ratings, it's October and November. Looking back over the year, I thought that my opinion on the months might differ from the overall scores, but I find myself agreeing with them. If I had to choose, which I guess I do since I've been building up to this, then it would be November. October didn't have a game in the Don't Bother With section, but I think that's a testament to the quality we received in November. Morbid the Seven Acolytes might not have been that great, but all the rest of them were, and I could see myself playing them in the near future, even Eldest Souls, even if it was just to run a few tries at a boss. That wraps up my thoughts on this year's bundles. Overall, I'm fairly pleased with the year, but I'd love to see how it stacks up to next year. Do you agree with my thoughts? What month or months were your favorite? Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. I hope this video helped you in some small way, and if it did, then please consider leaving a like, comment, subscribe, or whatever it is you feel like doing. Thanks for watching, and have a happy new year.